Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, back with another weekly market recap featuring Lance Roberts. Lance, how you doing, buddy? Well, it's Friday. We made it. Another week down. <laughs> <laughs> another week. We made it. And this has been, you know, things, I would say the heat continues to get uh, turned up in the kitchen here. Um, yeah. I, I've got a lot of things I want to talk with you about. Um, let's start with yields. Um, but real quick, before we get yeah. to them, um, and I will ask you what your theme for the week is as well. Um, I, I do just want to mark that we, this isn't the first time we've talked this week. We talked right. earlier this week when we did our live Q&A yeah, yeah. on YouTube Live. And, and that was a great, uh, you know, trial of a new uh, capability for us on this channel. You know, we thought it was going to be well received, but we didn't really know going in. So we had you and we had uh, John Lodra and Mike Preston from New Harbor Financial, the other uh, advisory firm that Wealthy on endorses. Uh, and then we just took people's questions for what, like an hour and 20 minutes or so. And I got to say, um, I, I really like the experience. I, th I think it's a great new format and we have a new software that we're using to kind of manage the visuals and whatnot mm -hmm. um, that, that I really liked. Um, but I was, I, even I was kind of blown away by the positive feedback that we had from folks um, you know, who watched it and the yeah. comments they sent or the emails they sent me directly. I think we've got a new hit on our hands. And if I can put a little bit of pressure on you, social pressure on you, um, folks are asking, hey, can we make this a regular occurrence, maybe even monthly? Are you up for something like that? Um, sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> all right. And you we, know, you know me, we'll, I've just got tons of time sitting I know, around. You know, it's not it. like I do anything else all day anyway. So sure. Why not? No, all actually, right. actually, that it'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'd enjoy doing that. Okay, great. And folks, just to make sure I'm not misinterpreting here, if you'd like to see it done regularly, monthly, quarterly, whatever, just chime in in the comments section below and we'll listen to what you tell us. Um, the other thing I want to quickly touch on before we get to the week's events, Lance, is um, we focused a bit last week on talking about the challenge that a lot of people who are viewers of this channel feel who are sitting on a bunch of cash, that they, they moved to cash in their portfolios a year ago, three years ago, five years ago, seven years ago, uh, because they were worried about the market dynamics. And then they kind of got stuck. Every, every time that they were going to go redeploy, they looked at the macro environment and said, gosh, it looks even worse now. And they kind of, you know, they, they've kind of been stuck in cash. I think they're now at a point where they're feeling like, all right, there's enough storm clouds here on the horizon that I, I, I want to be well positioned for what's coming. Um, maybe I want to start making, you know, some, uh, taking some positions based upon, you know, whether it's these monthly recaps we've done on Wealthy On or they've been listening to some of the other guests that we've had on this channel. Um, but they're they're stuck. They're trying to say, okay, how do I how do I go deploying this cash without just kind of going all in? And then, you know, if this market correction I fear it all of a sudden suddenly happens, you know, I'm the last greatest fool who just held out till the end put his chips on the table and then the losing hand came and just wiped it all away. Right. Um, you don't have to, to answer that because you did a great job answering it last time. But I, I heard from folks that really resonated with them. Um, they very much both appreciated the discussion. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, from what I've heard from, from John Penn at your organization too, that he's had you know, a number of people reach out and uh, said, you know, people have been very happy to talk to an advisor who kind of gets that, but, but have you guys have been helping them kind of craft a strategy. And as you said last week, whatever you do, it's going to be gradual. You're not, you know, like many other kind of standard brokers who would just take your money and put you hundred percent in the market. You're going to come up with something a lot more gradual for them. I'm just curious, since you guys have been having those conversations over the past week, anything to add to that? Well, first of all, it was interesting because John got a lot of emails, but I got a bunch of emails from people directly just saying, you you were just talking to me. That whole show was just me, right? And 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 it is. It, and, and this isn't the first time. And and again, you know, the conversation we had was the fact that we have people coming into our shop all the time that have been in cash since two thousand eight, two thousand nine. And uh, as you said, it's just, you know, when the, they'll say, well, I'm going to get in the, when the next time the market declines, I'm going to get in. But when the market declines, they're convinced it's going to go lower. So they don't get in. And then the market runs back up to new highs. And they go, well, it's too overvalued now. I can't buy it here. And the market just keeps going up without them. And, you know, that's that psychological trap that we get into. And again, it, it's this is, you know, so, you know, this idea of, of trying to figure out how to get into the market safely I just spent a, a long time, I had a meeting with a, a client, a, a prospect uh, on Thursday of this week, talking about that very same thing. They've been in cash for a long time, very conservative, 
and they have some assets that they're invested in. So how do I get from where I am to your models and what you're doing? And it's a slow process. I mean, we tell people up front, look, this is a 16 to 18 month process to slowly migrate because we've got to wait for markets to pull back to buy equities. We've got to wait for interest rates to run up so we can buy bonds cheaper, which is that's kind of the, the juxtaposition of the markets. It's like interest rates are going up, bonds are going down. I don't want to own them, but that's exactly when you want to buy them, right? Because they're cheap. And, you know, that's, the, but see, that inherently is that psychological trap. And, you know, we're talking about this weekend's newsletter, which is talking about contrarian investing, contrarianism. And, you know, Howard Marks once said that, you know, being too early to a call is the same as being wrong. And that's very difficult for people to understand because when you're contrarian investing, you're buying stuff that everybody else hates. You know, the idea of buying blood in the streets, it sounds awesome. It's just very difficult to do for most people because when things are blood in the streets and they look terrible, and it looks like the end of the world. That's when you want to be buying assets. But that's very hard for people to do emotionally because like, I, you know, this stuff's already down. I don't want to lose more money. But that's when you want to buy, you know, be buying these things. You know, stocks are overvalued here. We do need a decent correction. That's going to happen at some point and we'll be able to buy stocks a lot cheaper. But that process is going to take a while. And, and so you're going to build one part of your portfolio right now. You're going to build another part later. And it's going to, like I said, it's going to take 16, 18 months you know, to try to get cash migrated into the market and into the portfolio to get it to where it's working. And this is the important thing to understand about investing. And, and everybody needs to step back for just a second and separate the difference between a portfolio and the S&P 500 index. And what I mean by that is, is that when you're looking at the index, like markets up, markets down, markets up, markets down. If you have a portfolio that's well-constructed, then it's got assets. When the markets are going up, it's got assets that are going to go up with the markets. When, But at the same time, if it's well-constructed, it's also going to have assets that are going down in value because that's what's hedging your portfolio in the event of a downturn in the market. And so when markets go down, those other assets go up. But you have to think about your portfolio. And this is the one thing, you know, investors make kind of two or three mistakes right up front. First thing is they look at whatever the high water mark was for their portfolio. So in January, we're at all-time highs. You look at your portfolio and go, my portfolio was $100,000 in January and I'm $90,000 now. Oh my gosh, I'm losing money. But you go back two years ago and the portfolio was $80,000, right? And, and it's grown because you had a 24% increase in, in 2021, right? So you've got to you know, not pick these, high, these kind of arbitrary marks to measure your value. The second thing you have to do is look at your portfolio as a whole, right? Don't look at specific holdings of uh, this stock is down or this bond is down and, you know, this isn't working and, and that is working. So why don't I know more of that and less of that? You have to look at the whole portfolio as an engine and say, is my engine running properly? Look, it, it, you know, if you're, if you're in your car and all of a sudden it starts making, you know, noises and, and there's smoke coming out from under the hood and it's, and it's you know, jumping around all over the place, it could be something really bad. It could just be a bad spark plug. It could be a very simple fix, right? So these are, you know, you have to look at the engine and say, okay, I don't need to throw out the whole engine and get a whole new engine. I just need to fix what's potentially wrong in the engine. And is there anything really significantly wrong that, that requires major repair? Most of the time, if your portfolio is well constructed, you're going to have pieces that may not be working. And let me give, give let me give you a really good example of this. So in our in our so when we build a portfolio, we have sleeves. So we have a, a portion that's equities, we have a portion that's fixed income, portion that's cash and alternatives. So in the equity sleeve, that equity sleeve right now is balanced between growth and inflation value organizations. Right now, we're overweight value and and inflation adjusted positions. And that's helping hedge the portfolio against market volatility. But we also have growth stocks in the portfolio as well because there are periods, in, and over the last week is a really good example of this, on Monday, growth stocks performed exceptionally well. So we call that the, inflate, the deflation trade, performed very well on Monday. On Tuesday and Wednesday, they did the deflation trade rotated into the inflation trade. 
And so this market's jumping right now all over the place. So if you're if you're migrated all in, and we you know we talked about one sided trades before, you know if you're all in the inflation trade, that's great until the moment that the deflation trade comes back into vogue. And with the Fed hiking rates and those type of things occurring with inflation, that deflation on trade is going to show up later this year. So if, if you're completely devoid of that asset, when that rotation in the market occurs, you're going to miss that support that you have in your portfolio. So again, it's all part of an engine. We want to make sure our engine runs smoothly and efficiently over time. And that means that sometimes assets aren't performing as well as we would like them to, but it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the engine. And, and that's the, and, and that's, and so if we build a portfolio properly and we train and, and move and going back to this idea of having cash and moving into a portfolio, if we eventually build this portfolio over time and take our time doing it, then once the portfolio is operational and the engine's running, it's just a function of, of, of anything, right? It's changing the oil. It's a tune up here and there. It's, it's minor tweaks. You don't have to be making these major changes and, you know, ripping out entire parts, you know, taking off the carburetor and putting in a new one. You don't have to do that. We're just simply maintaining the engine and maintaining its productivity over time. That's a great way to describe it. Um, it's another great analogy to partner with the gardening analogy that we've been using. Um, so now we got now we got auto mechanics. Uh, we got gardening. You know, I'm sure we're going to come up with five thousand more before. Yeah, you know. I, I know. I think I need to come up with a whole new title. Lamps, the analogy man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they're they are they are very helpful. Um, all right. Well, so let's 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 pivot here now to the theme of the week. Um, I think I know what it's going to be, but what would you call it? It's it's a uh, theme of the week is contrarianism because yeah, that's what I thought uh, again. It, it, and this is also kind of the subject of the newsletter this weekend at realinvestmentadvice.com is, you know, this is we're in that kind of critical stage of markets where trading the market this week has been very difficult. And so if we go back to last week, we were talking about uh, both in the newsletter as well as in our daily commentary every day this week. Uh, shameful plug if you sign up for it at our we send you an email every morning before and the market opens and we have a chart in there it's called pre-market trading and every day we just review where the s p is and and kind of what the technical dynamics are and all week that message has been markets are overbought we had this really you know we were really oversold three weeks ago we talked about this reflexive rally that we were going to have because there was so much negative positioning we had this huge you know 10 percent advance in the market got the markets very overbought. And, and we so, so we started saying, hey, look, markets are very overbought. We're going to get a pullback. Importantly, what we need to have happen is this market maintain support here at the 50-day moving average and work off this overbought condition. That's exactly what's happened this week. We've maintained the markets has been trying to decline, but it's holding up fairly well. And we've almost completely reversed that real big overbought condition we had just from a couple of weeks ago. So this is potentially setting up an opportunity for the markets to rally a little bit more this month because April and May tend to be seasonally strong months. So if we take a look at the seasonally strong six months of the year, we're in that window. Now, the, the reason we're, we're talking about contrarian investing this weekend is that the market equity side is doing okay. Fixed income is not doing okay. And the FOMC out this weekend, or, or the, or sorry, this past week, saying they're going to have to hike rates more aggressively, $95 billion in taper. It all sounds great on paper. Doing it in reality is going to be a very different story. Um, and as we've been talking about before, historically, rates do rise. The 10-year treasury rate will rise when the Fed is hiking interest rates. When the Fed is hiking interest rates and tapering their balance sheet, this is where it becomes problematic. So for the next month or two, the Fed is, and, and you and I were talking about this last week, the Fed's not tapering anything yet. Um, they're going to start tapering their balance sheet sometime after May. And we don't know exactly when that you know, initial trigger will launch. We're assuming it's gonna start in May, but it could be delayed till June or July, it's, it's up to the Fed. But you know, they're going to be hiking rates. And when they start tapering that balance sheet and reducing liquidity in the markets, that's where equities are going to potentially have more trouble. The question now becomes, though, how much can they raise rates before they break something? And this is what we've been talking about for a while is, is you know, with mortgage rates at 
with lending rates coming up, with you know high yield spreads starting to rise, there's a lot of indications that there's not a lot of room in this market for them to hike rates. I put out on Twitter this morning, just kind of a adjunct poll because Brainerd says we need to hike rates to you know four or five percent on the Fed funds rate, and that sounds great in theory. And I said I'm just throwing this out there. I think they make it to one percent before they break something and. Few people are arguing with me, but we've all kind of got a poll running. But interestingly enough, nobody's really above 2%. The, the general consensus is somewhere between 1% and 2% that they're going to break something. And I think that's a fair assessment. You know, um, We'll see um, how long it takes before the Fed starts reversing their paddle. But the point is, is that the reason we're talking about contrarian investing is that you know, in a bear market, if, you were, if, if the market was down 40% right now, and valuations were at 10 times earnings on equities, you would not be wanting to buy stocks. Trust me, you'd, you'd be like, uh, the, the index is going to, how do we know? And by the way, how do we know this is true? Because this is exactly what happened in 2008. Everybody was convinced the index was going to zero, right? Not, not 40, not 50, it was going to zero. Market was over and done with. And of course, at 666, not to make any implications, <laughs> that's where the market bottomed. And you know, the rest is history over the next 12 years. So you know, the thing is, is that when things are very negative and things aren't working well, you're not going to want to buy things. And right now, that's the attitude towards bonds is that they're going down, interest rates are going up, bonds are, you know, yields are going to go to 50% or whatever the number is. And you know, why would you be in bonds? A couple of reasons. First of all, money markets are now paying money. I can buy ten-year. I can buy a, a T-bill floaters right now. Pick up almost you know seventy-five bips in some cases on floaters. You know, so you know all those yields are coming up. And one thing we've talked about over the last couple of years is Tina. Right? There is no alternative. I had to be in equities because there was no alternative to anything else. Well, guess what? Bonds now are an alternative. Just to give you a good example, we just bought one of our clients who has a lot of cash. We just bought him a, a very high quality corporate bond, one year to maturity, 2% yield. Now, at what point in the last 10 years have you been able to get a 2% yield on a one year bond? Hardly ever, right? So there is alternatives now. There is opportunity now in the markets. And, and this is a very changing dynamic. Do you want to say something? I'll, I'll I, I just want to chime in and say, I'm doing this from memory, but I saw uh, a chart or comment a couple of days ago that said the average dividend yield of the S&P is now one point something. Mm -hmm. So to your point, that 2% return in the two-year bond yeah. or note, I guess, um, uh, is now superior, right? right? So so to your point, there, you know, like you said, the, with, with the rates as low as they've been for so mm -hmm. long, it really was Tina, but now there's there's a legitimate alternative now to stocks. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, that's right. And you know, there is this alternative now that you know yields are coming up, and and here's the here's the important thing: as yields go up, bond prices go down. And yeah, it seems like you know this is a terrible time to buy bonds, and this is just going to go forever. Just remember that eventually, interest rates are going to break something. The economy is too heavily leveraged. There's too much corporate debt, too much credit card debt. Look at just uh, look at the credit card uh, data that just came out this past week. Huge surge in credit card data. Now, think about that for a moment, because this tells you a lot about what's going on in the economy, and it also tells you a lot about what's going to happen in the economy over the course of the next 12 months. So when we had all these checks going to households, the you know, $1,400 checks, $900 checks, extended unemployment benefits, child tax credits, you know, all of a sudden, people had a lot of extra cash to spend. Oh, and don't forget, they were getting checks and they didn't have to pay their rent, didn't have to pay their mortgage, didn't have to pay their student loans because we put moratoriums and all that stuff. So now they've got all this extra cash to spend. So they went out and they bought lawnmowers and you know, Home Depot was you know, chock full of people every weekend uh, despite COVID restrictions. <laughs> you know, everybody was fixing up their house. And you know, this was all great, fine and dandy. Well, they also had cash left over. So they started paying off the credit cards, right? And so now all that money's gone 
and they've all become used to a higher standard of living, right? They had all this extra cash, so they could just kind of buy whatever they wanted. So they were shopping more online. They were buying more stuff at the store. They were buying more food than they used to. And so now this their standard of living kind of creeped up here a bit. And now all that money's gone. And the cost of that standard of living has gone up by 8% over the course of the last year because of this inflationary pressure, gas prices, food prices, et cetera. And so all of a sudden, there's a gap between what they have coming in in terms of income and what they have in terms of their cost of living. I run this chart about twice a year, and I haven't updated it lately, but it just shows this gap. And this gap runs about $16,000 a year. That's the differential between the inflation adjusted cost of living since the 1960s and what incomes and savings alone will support. So the differential has to be made up with credit card debt, which is why you're now seeing this huge surge in credit card debt. Well, that's fine, except higher interest rates also increase the cost of supporting that credit card debt. Those payments go up, right? So this is all going to lead up to a very sharp slowdown in retail spending later this year. There's a very high correlation between rising inflation and lower corporate earnings going forward, which also means corporate profit margins are going to get squeezed. And there's also this is issue of the fact that when those corporate margins and economy slows down, people start to retract consuming. And this is where the Fed becomes, you know, becomes, you know, very challenged with trying to continue to hike interest rates. But this is where money starts rotating off and start going, starting to look for places of safety, which is your 10-year treasury bond. So again, you know, from a contrarian st standpoint, it may be early. And like Howard Mark said, you know, if you're too early to the trade, it's the same as being wrong. And that's true on a very short-term horizon. So if your horizon for making a, a, an investment into bonds is the next three weeks, don't do it. Um, our bond position right now is for the next nine months. And we're going to continue to build that bond position opportunistically until this environment breaks, because there is an almost assured, you know, there's nothing guaranteed in the markets ever. But the one thing we can do and the one thing that we try to do in investing is try to invest in the probabilities of things versus the possibilities. And, you know, we always use the, here's another analogy for you, gambling, <laughs> you know, but if you think about going to Vegas, if, you know, if you're sitting at a, a card table uh, playing poker and you've got a pair of twos in your hand, you're probably not going to bet real heavy on it. You've got a, now there's a possibility that you could bluff your way through a hand and you could win, right? That's a possibility. And it's a very real possibility. It's not a great possibility, but it's a possibility. But if you're sitting there with a full house or four aces or, you know, even three of a kind, all of a sudden, your probability of winning is substantially higher. So you're going to bet more heavily in that environment. Our probability of being right on treasury prices and economic growth, et cetera, over the next nine months is a very high probability. It's not a guarantee. Nothing is a guarantee. It could turn out to be terribly wrong for one reason or the other. But the odds of success are high enough that it warrants making that bet. But again, it's not a soul, it's not a one-sided bet. It's a very, it's one piece of our overall portfolio, which is also hedged and has equity exposure and has other stuff in it as well that's offsetting that risk. But there's a there's a very good opportunity that from a contrarian bet that that's going to pay dividends over the course of the next you know 12 to 18 months that should be very handsome. But you're gonna have to you're gonna have to be patient and let it work. All right. Very well said. And uh, Lance, you mentioned like literally like 16 things that I want to riff <laughs> off here. Um, but but just to the your theme there of contrarian investing, um, you, you mentioned a couple of other aphorisms, but another one is Warren Buffett's famous, uh, be fearful when others are greedy mm -hmm. and be greedy when others are fearful. And um, the challenge is in both extremes, it's hard to do, right? You're, you're, right. you're bucking the trend. Um, when you're being fearful when others are greedy, you're sitting out while FOMO is raging like crazy, right? And you're fighting that that urge. Of course, the other way around is, is you're to step in and start deploying your hard protected cash when people are bleeding from it, literally blood in the streets, like you said earlier. Uh, it, it can just feel so wrong given the immediate evidence that your eyes are seeing that it really takes 
a strong constitution, and as we say, week in, week out on this program, it takes having a plan, right? And you're just executing the plan versus trying to, you know, make a decision in the moment where your emotions are going to, you know, control much more of your thinking than, than, than just yeah. your, your brain's logic. Um, so uh, anyways, where we're going with all this is, um, or at least where I'm going with all this is, at this point, I think there's almost only one question that matters at this point. And I hate that we're here. And it's basically how big are Jerome Powell's cojones, <laughs> right? Where, I don't think they're uh, that this is the, this is the argument that Michael Leibowitz, my uh, co-portfolio manager and I are betting on right now. He's betting that his, he's got, you know, cojones the size of, uh, you know, the basketballs basically. And he's just going to fight the inflation fight and disregard all the rest. You know, I think history is pretty clear that their fortitude for pain is much less than people want to give them credit for. Uh, 2018, I think, is a prime example. The market was down 20% and he caved like a cheap suit. I mean, you know, it's it just, you know, there was no real backbone there to stand up against Donald Trump at that point. And as soon as Donald Trump started, you know, threatening him with his job, he was like, okay, I guess we're closer to the neutral rate than I thought. And, yeah. you know, and next thing you know, we're dropping rates back to zero. We're bailing out hedge funds and banks and everybody else. And, you know, and I, and that's, I think is a real telltale story about, you know, them and look, and, and Ben Bernanke's the same way. Look, and it's not just Jerome Powell, right? We go back to Janet Yellen. Janet Yellen in, in 1516, we've got Brexit going on in, uh, in, in Europe because of Britain, of the UK wanting to leave the Eurozone. So we had the whole big Brexit issue, right? And I was, I was stressed in the financial markets and like, oh my God, the banks were like, oh my God, you know, if, if Brexit happens, you know, the, it's going to cave the whole financial system, which was complete hogwash. But you know, the markets had had a, about a, a 10, 12 percent decline in 2015 uh, because the Fed started talking about, hey, we're going to start tapering the balance sheet, blah, blah, blah. Then we rallied back to all time highs. And then this Brexit issue came up in early 2016. So this is January, February of 2016. The market declines right at 20 percent. We didn't quite get there. It was like 19 point something percentage. You can verify the number for me. Um, but that at the bottom of that market, Janet Yellen calls the ECB and the Bank of England and says, y'all need to start doing QE because we can't. And the next day, the market took off and we didn't look back for the rest of 2016 and 2017 as we're going to. But now let's go back further. So 2008, Ben Bernanke. We need to do quantitative easing. Uh, we got to stop the financial crisis. So we do quantitative easing, right? And it works. We do TAMP. Uh, we do TARP. We do, you know, a couple of other things. We do cash for clunkers, cash for washers and dryers, you know, a couple other things. And the market starts to turn and we rally. So we're doing this trillion, uh, just honestly, $1 trillion worth of QE. That's all we did back in QE1. Just to, and now we're doing $120 billion a month, just to put that magnitude. Um, but the market rallies back and it was only supposed to run until June of the next year. So June, 2009 comes around, the market's rallying back. It's all great fine. I'm sorry, 2010 comes around, you know, it's all great fine and dandy markets are rallying and QE stops. And all of a sudden the market starts declining. And in September, Ben Bernanke is like, well, we need to do more QE because we can't let markets go down because of why 2010, what did Ben Bernanke say about QE? QE is specifically designed to boost asset prices in order to boost consumer confidence in order to strengthen economic growth. Has nothing to do with price stability, has nothing to do with full employment. It was all about getting asset prices up to boost consumer confidence and economic growth. And that is the trap we have been in ever since. The, the, the Federal Reserve, despite all this other news hogwash, has no backbone for a decline because of why. And it's not really they don't have a backbone. It's because every time the market declines enough, what happens? High yield spreads jump out. You can't refinance. The banks get in trouble. You got to bail out the banks. Right. Which the Federal Reserve is basically an entity that is made up by its member banks. That's at the end of the day, really, who the Federal yeah. Reserve it, serves. You, you would be sickened to know how much the banks get from the Federal Reserve if, if you actually knew the number. By the way, 
just as a side note, did you know that the profits that are generated by the Fed's balance sheet, which are no small number, by the way, are actually included as part of the corporate profits that are reported for the entire economy. So when you talk about NEPA profits or you talk about corporate profits, that actually includes the federal the, the interest payments coming off of the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Nice. Because they're considered profits. <laughs> And I actually, I, I, I run, you I love run financialization. A, huh? I know. I, I run a chart every now and then showing the difference between real corporate profits and, and the Fed's balance sheet profits. And that spread's getting obviously wider and wider, wider, and wider. as it goes. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, so I just want to get back to my point there, which is um, I, I hate the fact that, you know, as investors, what we should be focusing on is. What are the prospects for this sector? Are they good? Are they bad? Well, if they're good, what are the good companies in this sector? Which one do we want to pick? Right. That's what oh, investing you want. You want a free market. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think you might have even use this term earlier, but you know, what, what we're all forced to do now is speculate yeah. what a small number of people on the FOMC, you know, less than 10 people are going to do. And, and pretty much they do whatever Powell tells them. So it's really pretty much just one guy. We're trying to figure out what one man is going to decide. Um, and that just, you know, it's, it, it's, it's speculation, you know, it, it, it's, it's, no it's, it's maddening is what it is because, you know, this is, this is the thing, look, you look at valuations and, you know, valuations are second highest level or ever on record, right? Um, if you take a look at any measure of valuation, EV, EBITDA, um, you know, price to cash flow, price to sales, whatever, they're all in the top 90 percentile of historical valuations. And, you know, when you're looking at, and we were we were doing this the other this morning actually in our investment committee meeting, uh, we were looking through uh, the top ten holdings of a value ETF. Actually, it was a, a low volatility ETF to be specific. And you know, it's companies like Hershey's and Procter and Gamble and you know uh, Costco companies. You know, these are companies that are all trading at five times price to sales or better, right? And in no world. Should a company like Hershey's, as an example, trade at five times price to sell? What does that mean? See, the problem is we don't know what this means. Um, Scott McNeely back. Um, hey, so, think, sorry before you go, but go just, just go on. But just just share for folks what a traditional price to sales ratio would be for a company like that. People are more familiar with PE, so they might they might right. not know that five is well, actually pretty rich. Yeah. Well, so let me get okay. So let me just give you the story from Scott McNeely. Yeah. Uh, which will explain it. Right. Okay, uh, because by the way, companies that, you know, uh, in like the ARC ETF, they're trading at 30 times price to sales. So, the sell, by the way, um, importantly, sales is what happens at the top line of the income statement. That's your revenue. That's very hard to manipulate. At the bottom line is your earnings. And that's this is after all your taxes, your write offs, and all the other things that you can do to manipulate your earnings. To right. Make and non cash better. stuff like depreciation. And just you can, you can make earnings whatever you want if you have a creative enough account. Well, and look, Walt, there was a, a survey, Wall Street. I, I write an article about this every now and then, but there was a survey by the Wall Street Journal and they interviewed all these CFOs of major SP 500 companies. And the, the bottom line of this, the, the long and the short of this study was, is that 20% of earnings are fudged. And they do it specifically to boost bottom line earnings in order to support asset prices because of how they're compensated, right? We've, don't get me off on the rail for stock buybacks, by the way, but that's why Right, but this is just, a, this isn't a parallel abuse those guys are doing to juice their compensation. Exactly, because that's, that's how they get paid. So, so there's a big incentive to manipulate that bottom line earning. And then we've done even worse to, to investors by, we used to report everything in gap. So, you know, there, there was a day when I was managing money back pre-2000 and you would get these things, they were called 10Q and 10K reports. And you would actually read these 10Q reports because these reports actually detailed what the company was doing, what they were earning. And it was all about gap earnings. This was you know, generally accepted accounting principles, how they report earnings. And that's what the entire 10Q was covering. At the very back of the 10Q was pro forma earnings. Now these pro forma earnings are earnings that I would have made if everything in the world went exactly how I hoped it went and nothing bad ever happened. And I made these miraculous levels of sales 
this is what I would make. And that was always considered to be the fluff section, right? Nobody paid attention to pro forma earnings because they're all BS, basically. Gap earnings is what matters. That's what's reported to the IRS. That's what you made. The beginning of 2000, in order to, you know, Bill Clinton changes the compensation rule, puts a cap of a million dollars on CEOs. And so everybody had to get creative how to, how to compensate CEOs, which is where stock buybacks proliferated. And then we all decided to move so we could support those astronomical valuations to operating earnings. So now all of a sudden, operating earnings are at the beginning of the 10Q report. So basically, the majority of your 10Q report is basically bullshit. The last five pages where they report gap, that's the stuff you pay attention to, but we don't do that. Uh, and that's why there's this long list of, of you know, disclaimers all through the 10Q report now. But you know, this is, this is the environment that we've gotten ourselves into. You know, over the course of, of this time frame, and and as we talk about valuations and price sales, so so back to Scott McNeely, and, and the reason that explanation is important is to understand what Scott McNeely said. Now I'll have to paraphrase what he said because I don't have it by memory, but basically Scott McNeely says if you're paying ten, so this is back in 1999, uh, Sun Micro was one of those hot companies that was just going through the roof, right? And they were trading at ten times, just ten times price to sales. In, in 1999. And Scott McNeely said in an interview, he said, if you're paying 10 times price to sales for my company, you have to assume that I'm not, that, you know, every dollar of revenue that comes into my company, I'm sending to you on a pro rata basis. Uh, I'm not paying any of my employees, which is pretty hard to do. I'm not reporting or paying any taxes, which is kind of illegal. And I'm not doing anything to help grow the business. I'm doing no capital reinvestment, no R&D, no nothing. You're getting 100 cents on every dollar that comes in to the business at 10 times price to sales. That's what you have to be paid. And in order, and, and he says, so what are you thinking, right? That's the, the bottom line of his statement. Right. And just to be clear, right. he's doing that for the next 10 years. That is correct. Well, that's exactly what I say. And that, that's to assume, by the way, that the price never changes. That is just supporting the price. So if you're trading it, at, and look, there's a lot of, right now we have more companies than ever before on record trading at 20 times price to sales in the indexes right now. So just gross overvaluation. So a, a fair value, a fair price to sell. If you're going to go screen for a bunch of companies and say, I'm looking for some good companies to buy, you typically want to buy a company that is trading at two times two, deuce, dose, right? <laughs> two times, not 10, two times price to sell or less. And at that rate, a company can afford to basically grow their sales at a rate to support the current price. It doesn't mean the company's going to keep growing in price. You're just saying, hey, at the current level, <coughs> excuse me, at the current level of sales, I can support the current price of my company. At three times, four times, five times, six times, you're now talking about increasing sales on an annual basis, again, just to support the price. You're talking at four times price to sales. You've also you've almost got to double your annual sales on an annual basis to support the current price. And so we're trading. You know, we've got companies we're calling value stocks, trading at five times price to sales that are growing earnings and and revenue at you know ten percent a year. And it's just that's that's a healthy company, right? I mean, Procter and Gamble, Hershey's, etc. Healthy companies. No way they can support that current price. But that's two functions of of things. One, it's the, it's the excess monetary liquidity that we put into the markets that have completely, you know, d dwarfed and diminished the value of valuations into the markets. And the second is passive indexing. Passive indexing is distorting markets all across the board. And because if I, if I go buy this low volatility ETF, they have to buy all these companies. And so everybody's piling in to value ETFs or piling in to low volatility ETFs, et cetera which is just making the valuations of all those underlying holdings, you know, just go up. Now, if there's ever a change where those ETFs are getting sold off, you're going to have devastation occur across lots of companies. And you're going to go, why is this company going down so much? It's a great company. It's going to have nothing to do with the company. It's going to be the function of ETFs getting dumped into the open market. All right. So here's where I'm going with this. I'm going to bring it back again to Jerome Powell's private parts. Um, I know I sound pretty obsessed on that. I don't mean to. Don't mean to be creepy. Um, but 
again, how how committed, courageous is he going to be to do what it takes to tame inflation? And um, I talk to a lot of people, Lance, I mean, I talk to you every week, yeah. sometimes twice a week like this one, but I talk to a lot of other people as well. Um, just had a phenomenal um, interview that I was a fly in the wall for uh, because I, I asked Stephanie Pomboy to be the guest host for Wealthy On for this one. It just launched today. Uh, it was her interviewing uh, David Rosenberg, yeah. who highly respected economist and, and, and market analyst, um, very known deflationist. And he, he believes that deflation is going to prove to be the bigger trend here over the next year. Um, folks, if you want to watch that, you totally should. If you haven't seen it already, I'll put up a link to it here. Uh, but where I'm going with this is um, I'm talking, I talked to a lot of people. I think almost all of them agree with you, Lance, in terms of um, the, how overvalued this market is and that it's a house of cards that's going to correct at some point for whatever, whatever the pin that is that pops this everything bubble. I think everybody thinks it's days are numbered, right? You know, could there be a blow off top on the process there? There are a few people that are still making that claim. Um, but what it, what, where I see them now breaking into different camps is we think this thing is going to start correcting hard. And there's a camp, sounds like maybe you're more in, and I would call it the larger camp that's saying, Yep, for all the historical reasons you mentioned and the political pressures and just the screams from the populace and everything and from the corporations and from the banks, Powell's going to be forced to pivot again here as things just get too painful, right? Mm -hmm. And he's basically going to have to just pivot from tightening back to easing and we're going to somehow deal with inflation. We don't know yet, but we got to just stop the bleeding, right? I would say that's probably the majority view right now, but there's a growing number of people, and I would put both Pomboy and Rosenberg in that, um, that say, you know what, uh, I, I think Powell's a lot more serious than people realize here, and he's wrapping the cloak of Volcker around himself, and he's going for posterity here as, as the guy that, you know, did what the moment needed to do. I'm not saying you have to believe that, but I'm just saying, um, you know, <laughs> Those, the, the, which decision he makes have very, very different outcomes. Yeah. And we're all forced to basically pick a side here on that. And it's one of the things that I, 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 I think is a reality of the moment, but I hate that it is because the world shouldn't pivot on what one guy is going to do here. Right. No, I agree. First of all, let me say something about David Rosenberg. I've known David Rosenberg for years. I've We used to go out to um, California together and, and did our fair share of drinking back in the day. Um, great guy. Um, everybody, there's a lot of people that go, well, David Rosenberg, he's bearish all the time. And you're absolutely wrong if you say that, because in 2009 and 10, he took a lot of heat because he was bearish in 2007, 2008. He took a lot of heat in 2009, 2010, because he flipped bullish. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, how can you be bullish? This is ridiculous. And he's like, look, I'm telling you, this market's going to go up. And he was bullish for quite some time on the markets before he, he kind of flipped back over to the bearish camp again. And, and, and you know, again, though, he's a longer term thinker. And we were talking about this contrarian investing, you know, Howard, <clears throat> Howard Marks comments, you know, being, being early is the same as being wrong. You've got to understand David Rosenberg's views are long term. He's going to be right. The question is just a function of surviving until you're right. And this is, and I want to be really clear is that I'm not really betting on one thing or the other. I'm going to respond to whatever happens. But I will tell you, if you go back to August of 2018 and read the notes from the FOMC in August and September, Jerome Powell had the cloak of Paul Volcker wrapped around him in September of 2018. We're nowhere near the neutral rate. We're going to be hiking rates. We've got to hike rates more. We've got strong economic growth, unemployment. We've got inflation coming up. We need to hike rates more. 20% down two months later, we're right at the neutral rate. We're we're good, right? Right, right. And, no, and, I get it. To and total so, glass jaw. You're, you're uh, absolutely uh, right. Total, and, total so glass so jaw. all yeah, that's all. Look, I you know I'm not making the case one way or the other. And again, you know I'm I'm a I'm kind of a poker player here. Is I'm making a bet because I think I've got a pretty good hand. But I'm smart enough to know that if somebody's starting to bet really heavy against me, that maybe my hand's not as good as I thought. So, you know, we're monitoring that. And, and, you know, I just have this very sneaky suspicion. And look, let's be clear what's going to happen here. If 
I want to I want to I want to say this with big capital letters if this market does break and we start getting this big kind of watershed event in, in financial markets and again there's no guarantee that's going to happen <clears throat> there's a lot of there's a lot of capital sitting out in the markets I'm I'm amazed at how much global liquidity continues to flow in to the US we can't discount stock buybacks because that has been a massive flow of capital into equity markets and that's been keeping cap have been keeping assets market asset markets elevated. I'll spit that out. <laughs> There's a lot of things that clearly can support the financial markets at a level that you're going, this just makes no freaking sense whatsoever. But that's what markets do. Markets do things that will frustrate the bears all day long and will frustrate you to the point that you'll finally throw in the towel exactly the wrong time. So don't discount that side of the equation. I'm not arguing the fact that we can't have this big watershed event, but as soon as we do, beware that immediately the federal government is going to start sending checks to households. Mon modern monetary theory is now the go-to monetary solution every time we're going to have every time we're going to have a hiccup in the economy of some sort, and it doesn't matter whether they're conservative or Republican because it's all about votes now. It's going to be, we got to send checks to households. That is the new support for the economy. The Fed's going to drop rates. They're going to do QE. They're going to start buying uh, you know, junk bond ETFs. And look, there's a, there's a large contingent of people that says they're going to get a congressional approval to start buying stocks. <clears throat> That's illegal for the Fed to do right now, but they'll have to have a congressional charter to do it. And I am sure that Congress will be happy to pass that charter for them and allow them to start buying stocks if necessary. So, you know, and all I'm saying, you know, Adam, and I'm, and I'm not arguing with you or any of your guests because I admire them all and I think they're all right. All I'm pointing out is, is that be careful lining yourself up saying, I'm going to ride this puppy down into the dirt because this is going to go, you know, we're going back to 666 on the S&P. Long before we get there, the federal government's going to be throwing the, throwing the kitchen sink at the markets. Yeah, and I'm right there with you. I, I, my, my point was sort of dual fold. Um, one is to show that that's the that's the this, uh, the prediction that I'm seeing the most bifurcation on right now. Yeah. Which is that you know some people are going, no, no, the Fed's definitely pivoting, and some are saying, nope, they're going to be a lot more committed than folks realize. And, and like I said, both those paths sort of have different um, uh, different repercussions. Um, but you know, more than anything, I think it's, it's, I'm trying to make the underscore the point of uncertainty, which means diversification and active management, you know, become even, and risk management, those three things become much higher priorities than they've been over the past decade or so. Right. And we've, we've yeah. flogged each one of those horses at, at some point <laughs> in our discussions here. So I, I won't flog any one of them, um, so much right now. Um, one observation, and then I want to get to one more topic. Um, uh, I just wanted to note um, that even, even though he's saying, look, I, I, I think Powell's really going to raise rates a lot higher than the market's expecting and whatnot, um, he still is bullish on long-term U.S. Treasuries as well. Um, and as you and I have talked about, you know, and this is where bond math can get a little bit complicated for people, is if the Fed pivots and goes back to easing, that should be bullish for long-dated U.S. Treasuries, right? So they're, they're, they're working to bring rates down. Bond prices should go up. Um, if the market goes to hell in a handbasket, that can be bullish for long-dated U.S. Treasuries. Uh, because as you talked about earlier, capital from everywhere, both within the U.S. and other asset classes, but also from the rest of the world, is just seeking safe haven. And besides gold, the U.S. long-dated Treasury is the gold standard for safety. In fact, it, it's even more so. Than, it's, it's even more of a gold standard than gold is uh, in the world right now. So um, again, just flagging that you can you can have, you know, you can have an asset that that actually benefits in both scenarios, or flip conversely, you can have assets that are going to do poorly in both scenarios as well. And, and my point is, it's complicated. Um, there's a lot of factors in play. No matter how much you pregame it. Um, the old Mike Tyson, um, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth, right? Um, which is, um, you know, nobody is going to going to accurately predict all the permutations in advance here, which is why, A, you got to start with, you know, a plan that sort of like you were talking earlier about the engine, you have to have, 
have created this portfolio where parts are going to do well and other parts won't, but hopefully, you know, you're, you're maintaining the engine in, in such fashion that net net it's going to do better than it does worse. Right. And then of course, you know, my old saw about working with a professional advisor that understands all of this versus just trying to go it alone and figure all this out in real time on your own. I think there are extremely few people who can do that. Well, I'm not one of them. So that's the observation, Lance. I'll give you a chance to react to that. And then I want to just talk to you about, preparing for recession um, and not even necessarily um, with a portfolio, though, of course, we can talk about that, but just it looks like the odds of us going back into recession are higher now than they've been in a long time. And, you know, I want to just tease your brain for any advice you'd give to people to just what steps physically, mentally, financially should people be, be beginning to consider if indeed we think the odds of going into recession in the next three to 12 months is, is high. Uh, so two things. One, you know, uh, the, the old axiom about, you know, Mike Tyson, you know, you, everybody has a plan to get punched in the mouth. That'll happen with Jerome Powell. As soon as he gets punched, his plan will change. <laughs> so well, know, as we gonna, said earlier, he demonstrated yeah. he's got a glass jaw. So. Uh, no doubt. Um, you know, this is something that, you know, talking about going into recession. First of all, we haven't had a recession. And, and you're going to argue with me real quick, but hear me out. Let me let me get through the, the statement before you argue with me. Um, we haven't had a recession since 2008. I know technically we had one in, in 2020 for two whole months because it's fine. That's um, the blink and you'll miss it recession. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and the reason I say that, uh, and, and I'm not discount, it was a recession. I'm not saying it wasn't a recession, but it was what I call an artificial recession because we shut down the economy completely. So people got laid off and it was bad and it was a recession, but it wasn't one that occurred because of the organic nature of the markets and, and the economy. And that's what we're about to run into. We're about to play catch up on what was, we were gonna have a recession anyway, mind you, we were headed in that direction. And we may have had one in 20, late 2020 or 2021, had we not shut down the economy, we were heading towards a recession. It was, it was that was inevitable. Um, what the shutdown did was just kind of front load it and now, but we, but we didn't solve the issues of what a recession does, which is, you know, reducing, uh, reducing debt levels and reducing excesses in markets and those type of things. We exacerbated that now. So the, the, what should have happened during the recession was reloaded very quickly. So now we're going to have more of an organic, natural recession most likely over the course of the next, you know, 12, 18, 24 months. Yes, sir. Yeah. If I may just chime in for a quick sec. Um, you're exactly right about 2020. I think you're right about 2008 too. In other words, we didn't let the natural clearing happen during that time as well. We had the parade of every new intervention, right? TARP, TALF, you know, QE. Um, and I think we can probably make some pretty good arguments that along the way since then, you know, I remember back in 2016, uh, then again, 2018, um, you know, the markets got really weak and, and the economy got weak and and then the fed stepped in in one way shape or form and goose things back up again so i i just want to i just want to disabuse anybody who who thinks okay well things naturally cleared in 2008 and then you know we were going to have our next organic uh recession 10 years later i think we try i think that i think reality wanted to have more recessions after 2008 and we've just been you know, kicking the can, kicking the can, kicking the can. So at this point, using your rubber band analogy, there's just not much more you can pull that band without it snapping. You know, you know, back in 2013, 2014, we had a manufacturing recession. That would have been a real recession also had it not been for other stimulus we had going on in the markets. Um, you know, we had, you know, 2018 should have been a recession, but we quickly, you know, 2018, 2019 probably would have been a recession with the Fed hiking rates but they quickly reverse that whole policy. Uh, you know, so again, to your point, you know, the Fed keeps kind of bailing out the potential to have a recession. And as we talked about, I think a couple of weeks ago, recessions are a good thing and you should have a recession and let it happen and let it do its natural job. Just nobody wants to deal with it because it's painful and it's not reelectable. So <laughs> nobody wants a recession on their watch. Yeah. Hey, and so, sorry to interrupt um, because I want us to keep going on this, but, you know, we, we got high on our outrage uh, soapboxes around stock buybacks. Um, it really does seem that there was a period of time, I don't know, maybe it was in the late 90s or whatever, but but where we just decided that these natural business cycles were bad. 
And since then, the policy has been to prevent them, right? And, and I'm sure people have heard this analogy before, but it's, it's let's use the forest fire analogy, right? Where if you, if you just take a zero fire policy in a forest, um, what you end up doing is creating more and more tinder or more and more flammable forest so that when a fire inevitably does happen, you're never going to be able to prevent one. It's much more devastating because the forest hasn't been cleared out on a cyclical basis of the most flammable ingredients, right? So that's what we've sort of done here. But I'm just, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but I just, you know, what, do you, what caused that shift where we just said, we're going to start thinking magically and say that we're just going to take a zero recession policy here and, and A, how could we have been that, that hubristic to think of it, but how could we be... Have, so dumb as to pursue it for as long as we've had. Well, th this is where the where the Federal Reserve became all powerful at, at that point, and and really this is the late '90s. This was early 2000, and this is where the Fed really kind of you know the Fed's been around for a long time, but they were always kind of in the background. You know, it, you know, in the 1980s, nobody could name the Fed chairman. Nobody knew who you know who's the head of the Fed. Nobody knew. Most people didn't even know what the Federal Reserve was, right? It was just this kind of mythical thing. Even today, most people, you know, if you ask most people, they there's they do these polls all the time. You know, name the vice president. They have no idea who, who the vice president of the country is. Um, you know, and that's just kind of normal, right? As, as most people are just getting on with their life and doing things. But you ask people who the the head of the Federal Reserve is today. Everybody knows he's like a rock star. Uh, but that really started in the late '90s, and this is where the Federal Reserve really kind of came into the forefront of, hey, we've got this power to control outcomes. And the banks became very influential, this financialization of the economy. And again, the Fed is owned by the, by the member banks. And the banks were like going, hey, don't let this party in because we're making money hand over fist. And look, don't forget that the reason that corporate pensions went away and, and the reason that corporate pensions switched to um, you know, being underfunded like they are today is because everybody was getting into this game in the 80s and the 90s going, hey, it's not fair that as a pension, I'm stuck all in treasuries and trying to protect the future value of the pension for the pensionees. I need I need more returns, right? I need to get equity exposure. And, you know, we just keep doing this stuff so that Wall Street and those involved in Wall Street can continue to make more and more money and, and this has been a giant wealth transfer mechanism from the bottom 80% to the top 20%. Let me give you a good example of what's happening right this second. Right this minute, there is the Job Act 4.0 in process in Washington that they're trying to get passed. Now, the best thing that can happen is this thing never gets passed. But what this, what this bill wants to do is build on the previous Job Act and now allow mom and pop retail investors to invest in private equity which is illiquid, complicated to understand. And most people that I deal with on a, re on a retail basis, they, they are mostly clueless about how stocks and bonds work, much less how to read a balance sheet, right? And, and now you want to introduce them into one of the more risky asset classes in, in the investment market, private equity, which again is illiquid, it's highly complicated, there's lots of risk to it, and it comes with a binder about this thick that has just chapter after chapter of all the risk of how you can lose all your money. And Wall Street wants to sell you these products. Why? Because they can take the stuff that they don't want and sell it to you, and it doesn't have to be public money. And this is just another way to extract wealth out of you. And guess what happens? We're going to change this dynamic of what we call an accredited investor, you know, to some other measure so that anybody can get into private equity. And then when you lose all your money, which is going to happen more often than not, you're going to have no recourse to get it back. And that's, you know, this is just another way that Wall Street continues to pay off senators and congressmen and say, hey, it'd be a really good idea. We could put annuities inside of 401k plans. This is a great idea too. Who makes the money? Insurance companies. You know, it just goes on and on and on. It's just this nonstop wealth extraction machine that's happening. And we continue to allow it to occur as investors because we keep piling into the ship. You know, it's just, yeah, you want to sell me SPACs? Who, who's 
an idea was that, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, here when you have a guy like A Rod, which hey, great baseball player, what does he know about running a SPAC? And right. you're sending people. Look, let me explain to you what a SPAC is if you don't understand what a SPAC is. Send me a check today. Here's my address. Send me a check. Once I get your money, I'm going to go try to find something to buy with it. You know, you have no idea what I'm going to do with your money. And I can go buy some garbage piece of company and take all your money and you get nothing out of it. And that's right. exactly it, what's happening with a lot your of these point, stacks. the guy you're sending your money to, he may not have any idea yet. It's, it's give me the money yeah. first. I'll figure it out later. Now, maybe if I was going to send A-Rod money and he was going to buy a baseball team, maybe, right? <laughs> At least he understands baseball. But, you know, anyway, I'm not picking on A-Rod. This is all SPACs, right? The SPACs yeah. should have never been allowed these the, the, to be sold to retail investors. And it turned out terrible. Retail investors lost a ton of money. But who made the money? Wall Street. Because right. they sold you product because you wanted it. More speculation, more attitude. And SPACs should be named, you know, speculative assets, not, you know, special purpose acquisition vehicles. Um, but, you know, this is just, the, this is the thing that infuriates. Now, see, see, Adam, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. And I, 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 I spun you up and I got to reel you back in here because we could, this is great territory. I think folks would love to, for us to, you know, continue our rage on here. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to come back to this topic in a future video and give a little bit more time. <laughs> All right, fine. Um, I, and, I and, forgot what our topic was now. <laughs> well, exactly. Cause we're running out of time here and I do want to get your thoughts here on, on the recession yeah. uh, part of it. So let, let, let me reframe the question real quick. Oh yes. Which, yes. I remember, I remember Free, rephrase okay. your question. I'm good. Okay. So reframing the question is, is look, um, setting aside potentially for a second, how to invest for what we think might happen for this coming recession in terms of what asset classes we think are going to do well and what you might be buying or selling. Um, you know, recessions are not fun to go through. And based on what we just talked about, this one could be a bad one, right? We, we held off recession for so long that the pain of this one, you know, if, if all the forces get unleashed, could be could be pretty epic. Um, you know, people, they their their value of their financial assets go down, they might lose their job, right? I mean, there's their their home price could get whacked, right? And and I think I can make pretty good arguments that all three things might might happen. So um I, I just want to sort of ask you that general question of like, look, you know. Looking at it, see, seeing the storm clouds coming in of recession, is there any sort of general advice or grounding that you would give to today's human, not even necessarily an investor, but just, you know, a regular person? Like, what are the things that we should be thinking about now? So, Adam, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, um, you know, I think one thing that, that and, and maybe this is a poll that you can put out to, you know, all your subscribers and listeners. By the way, I meant to congratulate you earlier, earlier on hitting 100,000 subscribers your first year. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, Super thrilled about that. You were an important part of hitting that. So thank you for <laughs> helping us get there. My pleasure. Um, but look, I have two great partners um, who are certified financial planners, you know, at, at our shop. And they do a fantastic, you know, kind of a, a, a seminar, so to speak, webinar. Uh, called right lane retirement, and it goes through all of the you know necessary things to go through and to think about when thinking about retiring and potentially retiring in a high inflation environment, retiring in a recession, those type of things. And and Danny and Richard are very very smart, some of the best planners I've ever worked with, and that's something that you know if you're you know uh, you know if your viewers would be interested in and. In, you know, hearing some of that stuff from the financial planning side of the equation, uh, they would probably be very happy to, to uh, you know, be on with you to, to talk about those issues. Now, having awesome. said sorry, that- Sorry, I'm just going to interrupt real quick. Okay, Folks, sorry. if that sounds of interest to you, just let me know in the comments section below. And Lance, I'll work on a poll specifically when we come up with a couple of topics to see what folks would be most interested in. Sure. Sorry, go uh, ahead. Well, no, it's fine. It's just, there, there's so many things to consider, you know, uh, you know, but but going into a recession, if you think you're going into a recession, look, the best thing you can do is, you know, look at where you're spending money and think about, you know, look, if I'm if, what happened if I, if I lost my job, you know, a lot of people in 2020 never thought they'd lose their job and they were unemployed. Right. Um, you know, so if you lost your job for three months, six months, nine months, you know, do you have a cash cushion to you know support your way through this? And this is 
why even in our portfolio structure, when we're managing money, we always keep about a 5% position in cash and cash alternatives just for those unexpected emergencies. That way, you're not for, the, the important part about that is, is that you're not forced to sell assets at exactly the worst time in order to survive. You know, we, we talk about these 4% withdrawal rates. You know, think about this for a second. If the market's going down 10% and you've got to take out 5% of your money to live on, well, your portfolio is already declining in value. You accelerate that decline by withdrawing into a market that's already declining. So as your assets are falling, you're increasing that drag on your portfolio. 10 plus five is 15. But if you're drawing into a declining market, it's actually more than that. You're probably going to be down 16 to 18% because of the impact of selling assets into a declining market. So it's really depleting your capital much faster. So you need to have a buffer. Um, set up so that you can navigate a downturn in the market with, without having to withdraw assets or being forced to sell assets at the wrong time. The other thing to be thinking about going into retirement also is, you know, can I, if I know that I'm about to have a recession or I'm in a recession, can I reduce that withdrawal rate on my portfolio and, and minimize that drag? So that's going to be an important aspect to that of course, you know, the, the building of the portfolio, of course, as we talked about earlier, having that engine structure, you know, just as you kind of think about this process of, of potentially getting laid off, when do you claim Social Security? How do you claim it? Do you claim it? You know, there's a lot of other factors that go into that kind of that preparing for recession that you need to be thinking about and how you structure not only how you withdraw money out, but also how you protect the capital that you have that's invested in the financial markets. And that's where a good hedging strategy is in place, a good portfolio management strategy occurs. Um, you know, and this is where you also have to think about adjusting for rates of inflation and with just you know adjusting your, your planning, right? This is one thing that Danny and Richard do really well is thinking about forward planning. You know, a lot of financial plans are based on 6% annualized rates of return, and we use variable rates of return to adjust for market drawdown periods. What if we front loaded a bear market into your retirement plan? How does that affect it? And then building portfolio structures around that to hedge that risk. But it, it's, it's anything, you know, preparing for a recession is, is a little bit of a logical thought process. It's like kind of, you know, what would you do if you knew that zombies were coming, right? The zombie apocalypse was coming, right? You'd stock up on beanie weenies and ammo and, 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 and prepare for the, the eventual need, right? And it's the same thing with thinking about your, your you know, investments and, and your kind of your planning process for that recession is think about the worst case scenario. And this is the one thing we don't do well as individuals. Think about the worst possible outcome. Don't, don't necessarily take action, but go, if the worst happens, I lose my job, I can't get another job, I have no income for a year, what am I going to do? Because if you plan for the worst, anything else that happens is cake. It's easy, right? And, and things are never as bad as we think they're going to be. You know, the world's not going to end. You know, the, the world's not going to cease to spin. The sun's going to keep rising every morning. It's going to be okay. We may have a rough spot, but if we plan for the worst possible condition, anything else that happens is okay. We survive and we do better. The problem for a lot of people is they plan for optimism, right? 6% a year, 10% a year, whatever it is. And then one bad thing happens and it screws up the entire plan. Yeah, and and one common thing we see too is is when people's income gets whacked, right? You your hours get reduced, you get laid off, whatever. What we oftentimes see is people don't change their spending behavior <laughs> quickly, and oftentimes they keep spending what they spent, and they either drain you know their savings mm -hmm. and or they just put it all on the credit card, right? And they keep that going until they can't, and then they're in a much bigger problem because they have no cushion after that point, right? So I, it's super unfair to have asked you, I'm realizing such an important question when we're so incredibly beyond our time. You know, we always go long, we've gone way long this time around. Um, so Lance, I, I'd actually love to dig into this topic more with you and, and potentially your team there. Um, yeah. If folks are interested and folks, if you are, again, let me know in the comments section here below. One thing um, I'll just note on top of what you said there is, is, is one thing that people often do not do when planning for the worst is to think about, okay, well, what about the other people in my life 
that I have really strong relationships with, right? Like, well, okay, what if I plan for the worst, but my elderly parent doesn't, right? Or my sibling gets in trouble or, you know, my, my good friend, the neighbor or whatever, right? Um, and so you want to think about, um, again, how you might also be supporting other people that depend on you um, and how you might be supported by those people. And, and where I'm going with this is in doing kind of your, your wargaming here for recession, um, having discussions with those people um, that are, you know, you have you have these dependent interdependent relationships with should be a part of that process. Hey, but you know, I'll I'll look out for you and your family if you hopefully agree to look out for me and mine. If I happen to be the one that loses my job versus you, right? Um, I see you nodding as I'm saying all this. Um, so, folks, if you want us to dig more deeply into kind of all parameters around recession, again, let me know in the comment section below. Um, Lance, we're going to start wrapping things up here really quickly, and I hate to make it so quick, but two, a minute or less, can you just tell us any material trades that you guys have done in the past week? Nothing. Actually, this was a very, this week, markets really did nothing. And, you know, we were already kind of set up for a bit of a pullback in the market. So we actually had no trades this week. So okay, just well. kind of holding our, we're still about 30% cash, still holding our fixed income position. And, you know, our equities are doing their job of, of supporting markets. We actually have been, we're actually beating our index right now by about 300 basis points for the year. So, um, you know, the portfolio is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. All right. Good. Wow. Very succinct and good news too. So thank you. Um, all right. So in wrapping up folks, if you have not watched that Q and a session that I referenced at the beginning of this video with Lance and the guys from new Harbor, um, I highly recommend you watch it. Um, I'll put up a link to it right here so you can click on it and, and watch that next if you want. Um, Please, if you can, if you're enjoying these uh, weekly market recaps, I think this is number four, 14, Lance. Um, but folks, if you want to continue seeing more of this, let us know that you're enjoying it. Please hit the like button. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to this channel. Um, as Lance mentioned, we did hit uh, earlier this week 100,000 subscribers. If you haven't seen me, thank you, the viewer, on some of my previous videos this week. Let me do so again here. Um, this success is only made possible literally because of your support as a viewer, watching this channel, liking, subscribing to these videos, sharing them with your friends. Uh, so thank you for building this whole movement of financial resilience that is wealthy on. It is because of you all. Um, lastly, uh, if you have not yet had a consultation with Lance or one of our other financial advisors, um, just stick around at the end of the video. We tell you where to go to do that. It's free. There's no uh, commitment to work with these guys. But given everything we talked about in this video, um, highly recommend that you just have a portfolio CAT scan um, from a competent financial advisor who understands these issues. If you've already got a great one, uh, excellent. Send them this video. Say, hey, just talk to me about this stuff and how I'm positioned. If you don't or you want a second opinion, talk. feel free to talk for free uh, to one of our advisors. Um, and then Lance, I will give you the last word as we wrap things up here. Anything else you want to let folks know as we clock off? <laughs> Next week, don't get me into another rant. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will try. It's kind of hard because we both kind of enjoy it. Yeah. All right. Well, look, um, Lance, don't know what the next week's going to bring, but look forward to uh, dissecting it with you here uh, next Saturday. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.